and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the of the upcoming Dandies and Dandizettes, and making her foray into this weird and wonderful world of of polyhedral shenanigans, the one and only Cassidy Percoco. Don't call her precocious. <laughs> how you doing? How you doing tonight? <laughs> Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Um, sometimes people get some people. Sometimes people get thrown off by how I do the intro. No, I'm just like I'm ready to see what he's going to say next. <laughs> well, I am full of surprises. And now, I obviously I ended up doing a bit of di a bit of research and. That was the reason why I opened up the way th the way that I did, especially with with um, the things you were mentioning in your background on the Kickstarter page. Which, congratulations on getting dangerously close to five thousand and unlocking the final stretch goal. Thank you. I watch it every day. We all three of us sit there and stare at it and watch as it goes up seven dollars by seven dollars, <laughs> getting closer and closer. Uh, well, Rome wasn't built in a day. <laughs> yep. But we still have quite a bit of time, mm -hmm. so. But um, now, as as I understand it, you you have published a, a few books in the past, but this is your first foray into role playing games specifically. So, I usually open these up by asking about the origin story of some of someone. So, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. I mean, I was first introduced to role-playing, I mean, so these days in fandom, you get a sort of osmosis of everybody else's fandom. So I don't know when I was, like, introduced to the concept of Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons and other types of role-playing games. Mm -hmm. But, like, the first time I actually got involved with role-playing games was more um, on LiveJournal and forums, and it was more based on... You know, I have a character, you have a character, our characters are talking and interacting, mm -hmm. and so on. I, I know there was definitely a Harry Potter role-playing game I was in. There was a forum, I wish I could remember what it's called, and I've been trying to remember for years, that was, like, not Pirates of the Caribbean, but it was set in the Caribbean, and we were all sort of generally involved-ish with pirates, and I cannot remember what it was called, and it drives me crazy. But anyway, so for me... It's always been more of um, like a social role playing game mm -hmm. or social role playing uh, genre. And um, I did not actually try Dungeons and Dragons proper until a couple years ago um, when we had a group of Ask Historians, Flares, and Mods. Uh, Ask Friends is a subreddit mm -hmm. dedicated to people asking questions about history and then historians or people who are uh, amateur historians but who have lots of expertise answer their questions and I'm a moderator there. Um, and, and I did enjoy it although the game didn't last very long because we had time zone issues, <laughs> something you have some experience with. Preaching to the and, choir there. Um, it kind of fell apart. <laughs> It was just always so hard to get all of us at the same time. So, mm -hmm. of course, it do doesn't exactly help that depending on the time zone, you might have it where it's a reasonable time for you, but it's a, but it's the um, ass crack of dawn for somebody else. Exactly. We had one person in Ireland, and then I'm Eastern Seaboard, and I think there were some people who were at the other end of the U.S. <laughs> So it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. oh. I've had I've had some people ask how I put up with it. the The answer is Guinness. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> it's a vain hope, but sometimes I sometimes I drink my way into making it work. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that that definitely is the tactic. Oh. But whenever I whenever I bring these kind of thing kind of things up, I usually do, I usually don't um utilize the assum the assumption that some do that Dungeons and Dragons was their was their first. That does happen, mm -hmm. but experience has taught me that that's not always the case and well for at least one for at least one of my students it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> and since you mentioned that that you're a moderator for ask historians um i suppose this is either a good or a bad time to bring up that i've somehow lucked my way into being an amateur historian when it comes to the history of role playing games uh, oh, nice! You should hang out on the sub. Tempting, but I'm not. Sh I'm not sure how much I would be able to contribute on on that front. A lot of it is due to having the advantage of be of growing up in growing up in the places where where um, role playing was really born. Um, mm -hmm. in in particular places like places like Highland Park in Minnesota, and. I've I've been I've been to Lake Geneva a few times, but I ha but um, Minnesota and Wisconsin don't get along about anything. So I try <laughs> not I try not to stay in Wisconsin for too long if I can help it. Yes, but especially mm -hmm. since some people don't like the joke that I've made about Green Bay, where I said it's the only place I've ever gotten pulled over for sobriety. <laughs> So you've got a kind of New York, New Jersey relationship, Minnesota and Wisconsin. I'd say you can add you you may as well add Illinois in that in that. <laughs> um, if you put if you put if you put a guy from Minnesota, a guy from Wisconsin, and a guy from Il and a guy from Illinois, especially Chicago, in the same room, the only thing they will agree on is that one of them is wrong. <laughs> And of course, of course, when it comes to sports rivalries, that's st that's still very that's still very much the case. <laughs> um, <laughs> or or just good or just good old fashioned hockey fights because that's the way it go that's the way it goes when it's when it's winter half the damn year. Yep, yep. Oh, I used to live up in the very very north edge of New York State for a bit, and uh, all about the hockey up there too. <laughs> So you're f you're probably familiar with the infamous church sign that said, "Whoever is praying for snow, please stop." <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen that one. Mm -hmm. And well, the l the last time I ended up bringing up these storms and the, the winter storms in that kind of area is when I first learned about how not only do, not only is it going to storm, but not only you're going to get a whole lot of snowing and blowing, but sometimes lightning. Oh wow. Yeah, that's a that's a thing. Because as, as I've stated many times and I am unfortunately going to keep stating until someone ties me down and makes me stop, mother nature is on drugs. <laughs> but I agree. <laughs> so, shifting it shifting into that. Um even even though your first taste with Dungeons and Dragons didn't go well, did you end up experimenting with other games, or for, did you mostly stick with one, stick with one game over the years? Um, I didn't really experiment much. I tend to be a lot more about writing fiction, mm -hmm. so basically, we're playing on my own, <laughs> and uh, so I, I haven't done that much gaming with other people, to be honest. Aside from those social role-playing games uh, that I did on LiveJournal and forums, so send so send you a copy of Lone Wolf if I if I if necessary on your birthday or something. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, because I've heard good things. Well, there there's there's a whole subculture regarding um regarding game books, which are the closest things uh -huh. to tabletop role-playing, but with yourself. The other would be journaling games, but that's a whole other can of worms. Um, yes, it especially got big at, back in the day in the in the UK thanks to um, 
thanks to Ian Livingstone's um, body of work, especially the Fighting Fantasy series. The name's familiar. Fighting Fantasy is one of is one of those old hat names, and um, Livingstone was was an er, was an early guy in the better days of Games Workshop. You know, the days before they decided to, to keep pissing everybody off. But, but it, fighting fantasy would eventually get would eventually get a RPG version in the form of advanced fighting fantasy, and he's and um, Livingstone had even handled some module some modules in some form like death Tra like death trap dungeon over the years. But that he's done a lot of stuff is what is what I'm getting at. But yeah. Would, given th given that background of largely doing f largely doing fiction, um, what sparked the idea of creating a role playing game? Well, it was actually somebody else's sort of joking suggestion. Um, several years back, I was kind of trying to post um, uh, satires. Satire, uh, satirical comics, cartoons uh, from history mm -hmm. on Saturdays on Twitter and Instagram. And I would post it with a hashtag Satire Saturday. And it was a cute little thing. And one day I posted one from, I think it was like 1820, that was labeled Dandies and Dandiesettes. And that was really the whole joke is they're like, look at the dandies and their silly clothes. And somebody remarked like, oh, when's the role playing game coming out? I would play that. And I kind of went, huh, that sounds like an interesting concept. And then to be honest, I did not really work very hard on it for a while. But our lovely illustrator, Joanne, uh, was a follower of mine on Twitter, and I followed her. And she really encouraged me to actually write this. Um, and... And I did do some research into a number of different games that were more more storytelling based, mm -hmm. um, more I think of like more talky, <laughs> like Nobilis, um, which is just all about talking and and convincing other people to go along with your ideas. And and yeah, I just uh, sort of slowly started to put it together. And work out how it would actually work as a game. Mm -hmm. um, you'd probably get a kick out of out of um, f out of fiasco. I don't, I don't know. Oh, if I that think I may have it. come. That sounds yeah. familiar. Um, What's it like? Fiasco is very much in that in that story in that story game style, although. The although it's oh it's commonly described as a heist gone wrong and the I think the creators of it outright admitted that one of their big inspirations was the work of the Cohen brothers. Oh, fun! Uh, and when it comes to story, when it comes to story games, one of the big ones that was a massive influence for a lot of people was um, Everway, which recently came back. And oh, I don't know that one. Everway is a is a interesting beast, but that's a but that's a story for another night. Now, <laughs> taking now taking that into account, given given the re, given the strong regency theming, um. Because um, I've I've seen I've seen my fair share of re of Regency dramas and ca and came clo <laughs> and came close to taking part in one before I moved into another another township. Um, may may have been for the best because I'm pretty sure they wouldn't be able to find they wouldn't be able to find a costume in my size. It's <laughs> I'm I'm six six so. Oh good, wow! So good luck on that front. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna squeeze into something made for made for somebody who is five foot nothing. Yeah. But um, from your perspective, that 
that re that Regency era of England. What's mm -hmm. the appeal? What is it that what do you think it is that draws people to that particular era when it comes to storytelling? So this is actually quite funny because I was not really that interested in the Regency for a long time because I tend to be a little bit of a hipster, and it's so popular that for a long time I was like, no, I like the 1790s, which <laughs> if you know about Regency stuff, that's quite a statement. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just gradually got sucked into it, um, partly because uh, I, I was trying to write a book about 18th century fashion, and I got a publishing house interested but they said, could you do it about Regency fashion instead? So I wrote Regency Women's Dress. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was researching for that to get the you know specifics right, because I had a pretty good sense of the fashion in general, but um, I, I sort of got more and more into the Regency as a period. And I think it is in an interesting place where it there's not a huge... Um, popular consciousness of it the way there is like if you say victorian everybody everybody knows what you're talking about basically basically um and if you say like revolutionary america everybody knows what you're talking about mm -hmm. but regency is kind of in this middle zone where i think a lot of oh it, it still seems kind of obscure maybe because it's so short i don't know <clears throat> and i think that's appealing to a lot of people um, although nowadays it's kind of getting a little oversaturated and I wonder if we'll see people being a little less into it now. It's just so popular, but, um, I think another aspect of it is that even though there's plenty of military stuff happening during it, there's a sense of it as a sort of not military period, um, the vast majority of people who are into the 18 teens are not doing War of 1812 reenactments or um, being primarily interested in the Napoleonic Wars, which is something that we see for a lot of periods. Um, I definitely recognize this at Ask Historians, where so many periods are known by the war going on with them that's attached to it. Mm -hmm. And that's you don't see that so much with the Regency. It's very open to women, particularly uh, being taking a sort of academic interest in it. Where if you focus at, on the Revolutionary War, there is plenty of stuff that women were doing, and we're seeing a lot more of that being represented in public history. But there is a sense of like, oh, I don't really belong there. I don't belong in the you know tents there in the military encampment at the fortress. Um, whereas with Regency, I think there's a feeling of, of ownership from a more civilian angle. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jane Austen, Every, everybody loves Jane Austen. Yeah. And <laughs> I will, I will admit that I am, that I am just as, that I'm just as guilty when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to, um, associating certain eras with the, with, um, wars that took place and it's funny you mentioned napoleonic given um given the napoleonic campaign um with with the with the people who with um that aren't that arneson was a part of way way back in the 70s <clears throat> before du before dungeons and dragons was even a thing um yeah but i i my, i myself when when do, when um working on a project of my own, I ended up spending way too much time looking at fashion and specifically uniforms from that from that more pike and shot era of mil of military doctrine. Osprey books. Osprey books certainly helped, um, but something to something to keep in mind, and this is where my, this is where the tabletop historian in me comes comes out wargaming and historical wargaming was very big in the 70s and 
the big uh-huh. flag bearer for that was Avalon Hill. A lot of the a lot of these were attempts to try and were attempts to try and recreate certain battles in the Napoleonic era, the Revolutionary Napoleon. War, um, the the Civil War, either either the World Wars, and so and so on. And a lot of the ideas from that would get, would carry over into a lot of the grand strategy games that I grew up playing. Um, in on the video game end of things. As well as the concept of 4X. Um, the big example when it comes to 4X style games is, of course, Civilization, which mm-hmm. was originally an Avalon Hill thing. In that, but <laughs> the early day, mm-hmm. the early days of Civilization as a board game and then video game is complicated. I'll I'll put it that way. Oh. Um, I liken it to the reason why why when the ghost when Ghostbusters became a cartoon it had to label itself the real Ghostbusters. It's <laughs> something kind of like that. But gotcha. It's it's that kind of thing that I that I ended up draw that I end up drawing upon especially since um I've I've visited Fort Snelling um, in my, in my neck of the woods, it is a little bit out of the way, but I have been there, and it was through that that I was able to see certain examples of that of of that early black powder um, doctrine, especially regarding mm-hmm. th- things like how ungodly long it was to f- to um re- to reload your shot. Like the f- at most you at most you could maybe do three shots a minute, <laughs> right? But that was that was some that was something that I had drawn on, and when I th- and that bring that brings me to a qu- to a question regarding r- regarding um, role playing in this era, since it is one that a lot of a lot of people. Either either confused with another era, or or just don't have as strong of an understanding of. Um, there is the risk of over of overwhelming players and GMs when they sit when they sit down for the first time. So, in something like playtesting, how do you construct an elevator pitch for people who are not historians or don't have don't have the passing knowledge? They're just they're just coming in they're just coming in for the first time. Um, well, so far the people that <laughs> have wanted to play test have come in being like, "That sounds really cool. I want to do that." Mm-hmm. But in general, I think I would come in through uh, fiction. Possibly the way I have it set up is uh, at the beginning of the book is that you choose a theme, which is Austin, like Jane Austen, Hare, like Georgette Hare, and Radcliffe, like Anne Radcliffe. And Jane Austen is very historical, and Georgette Hare, um, who you may not know, is a like early to mid 20th century writer who wrote a ton of Regency romances and other historical books and she basically invented the modern Regency genre and so ev- basically everybody who has some interest in the Regency probably has a picture created by her in their heads and they may adore her books and so you know you don't have to think that much about the history because you already have that sort of in your head and um, the Radcliffe is sort of a different Kettle of Fish because she was an early gothic writer. Um, But similarly, you know, if you've ever seen Jane Eyre Mm -hmm. or you had a thought about, oh, the castle and there's like lightning behind the castle and somebody's running to the castle in the rain, like that sort of thing. So you already have some kind of picture in your head, at least for one of them. And I Mm -hmm. think that's a good entry point for somebody who maybe doesn't know anything about the history of the Regency. Yeah. Now, because of the fact that there isn't that the conflict isn't going to be as obvious for lack for lack of a better term mm-hmm. from an outside perspective um uh, 
either obviously the con the conflict that does have to arrive is going to be with with mo with the moving pieces and re and relationships and since you've described it as a as a very um shared narrative kind of game have you given consideration to the idea the idea of some of some sort of round robin with with the session 0 I know that I know that was kind of going a bit roundabout with that question. Um, not so much. Um, my thought is mainly that people do love the villains in Regency stories, and so I assume that somebody, if not just the GM, will be eager to provide conflict. Um, if you've if you've seen, you know, Pride and Prejudice, everybody kind of, you kind of love to hate Caroline Bingley. And so you, you, there's definitely going to be somebody who is happy enough to, uh, to be the villain that everybody else can oppose, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least that's my, my hope. Yeah. Now, when I, when I bring up a GM-less approach, um, some games like Mystic Empyrean, which styles itself as a GM optional game. Um, present session zero is the idea of people presenting characters and then going around um, and creating links that ca that characters might have with each other or with or with NPCs. Since that we that web of relationships oh. is something that I think is going to be key with a se with a setting and a backdrop like this. Yes, definitely. I don't set out that you have to... I don't explicitly set that out. Maybe I should, because to me, it's just kind of like, well, it's common sense. You have to get all these things ready. Um, but yes, definitely, you need to know... You probably could, if you really wanted to, to make it more realistic, have you know a house party where everybody has to find out who everybody else is as they play... But I think uh, it's certainly more simpler and maybe more enjoyable if everybody knows going in uh, who exactly everybody else is and how they're related to each other and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why I f that's why I find the three examples that you gave at the at the top of the Kickstarter page to be interesting because with each of with each of those you have this you have the starting point of a different type of story mm -hmm. and yes I, I wanted to make the point that you really can i'm giving enough information in the handbook that you really can do any kind of story that takes your fancy because there is while the whole regency interest thing is kind of narrow at the same time people do have a bunch of different interests and so to some people ugh, a country vicar is like so boring but to somebody you know to them the you know royal court is an extremely interesting setting and vice versa mm -hmm. and for for me cuz one of my favorite one of my favorite games when i when i started out was legend of the five rings which although there's plenty of fantastical elements it is doing a there is a whole lot of political maneuvering between the between the clans and at the time that I was starting out especially with stuff like world of darkness being the being the big guy in the room there was a lot of emphasis on on factioning and uh -huh. that's that's my early experience and I can say that if if I were tasked with G, with GMing it that's the kind of thing that I would um, that I would put in is that so mm -hmm. is is that sort of fa that sort of faction play, and to that end, have you have you considered putting in a um a sheet in the back of the book to allow a GM to track the um, web of relationships? Not so much because I'm not really sure how to represent that. Um, other than just, here's a blank page to keep your notes on, which, you know, is always good to have, but not so much like a specific 
relationship uh, page. I do think for the most part you're going to end up with families being the equivalent of factions uh, because family was so important. Kinship networks, as we say in the academic biz, uh, were really the way that people organized themselves uh, in groups to oppose other people's kinship networks. Is a, f is a fair point. Now, one of the other, given how given how imp how important certain fashions were, and give and given your background, is there? Do you plan on putting a, a bit of a crash course of that within the book? Oh yes. Um, one of the so so the book starts out with you know the very basic information about the themes and so on and then we have some information for character building you know figuring out what um you know what social class they are and so on and then the nuances within each social class but then when you get down eventually to more information about the culture the first thing you get is detailed information about the fashions and that's actually the was the first stumbling point for me when i was writing it because I got to the clothing and I was just felt like I was so overwhelmed with information about the clothing to put down that I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I had to just put it down and walk away for a bit and then start another section. Mm -hmm. um, very useful information, detailed information about the clothing of the period, I think. Uh, all right. I can go, I can go with that. <laughs> and I'd, and, the other thing, the the thing, when it comes to that, there's a bit, there's a bit of an there's a bit of a debate when it comes to campaign settings in games, um, called meta narrative. Mm -hmm. And this is this is in regard to stories that are very extensive in terms of the chain of events, which can result which. Obviously, more detail can result in more opportunities, but there is the argument that creating that can cause a can. How do I put this? Can can um cause it to be so, to be so tight that one does that one doesn't know where to insert the player characters. And there's no right or wrong answer to this, but <laughs> what I'm what I'm curious about in this case is is making sure that there are places for the GM to be able to in, be able to insert characters to the point that they don't feel like they're me that they're messing up some gr some grand continuity or something like that. Well, I think it definitely depends on the GM because I can very easily imagine somebody creating a very restrictive narrative but the idea is definitely more open world style mm -hmm. of of storytelling. And towards the end of the book, I actually give a few um, sample campaigns. I, although I don't know if sample campaign is quite correct. I call it sample game scenarios because I am actually really vague with everything. And I, so I gave, you know, I give a setting and I say which theme it is. And then here's a whole bunch of characters. You don't have to use all of them, but you can use some of them. And I don't even hint at how they should be related other than obvious, um, like, sibling, you know, or parent-child relationships. Mm -hmm. Because you really can do just about anything with the same cast of characters if you take them in different directions. And, like, I think this person is nosy but adorable and everybody loves them versus somebody else taking the same character and be like, this is the villain. Mm -hmm. She's the worst and she's in everybody else's business and they all hate her. And, and I think that is the benefit of a more storytelling game handbook. Um, there are some like dice mechanics at the back for people who really would like to have that element of unpredictability, but it's, yeah, I think I think most games will be um, much more focused on the individual player characters choosing where to take it than a GM who's just sort of there to you know either manage uh, NPCs as needed because you may need a lot of extra 
people at the edges um, or to, to just provide the basic structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of that, what sort of dice system were you, were you planning on going with? Given given the simplicity you're aiming for, I'm guessing you're sticking with something D6 related. Yes, it's it's super basic. Um, I think yeah, I think the only places where D20s are involved are like I, I came up with um, some tables for like if you need to roll up an NPC, you know, roll a D20 three times and and here are some characteristics for them. But yeah, it it is really D6 based. Um, the main thing is just rolling for success and failure mm -hmm. as necessary. And, you know, a one is a super failure and a six is a critical success and, you know, shades of gray in between. And um, it's just sort of to help guide role playing more so than, you know, doing a lot of dice rolls just to, you know, make it. So there's, there's something you can't always just say, well, oh, yes, I play piano and it's wonderful and everybody loves it and all your characters loved it. You know, you have to you have to roll and get a six unless you have a certain level of skill that you've you know chosen ahead of time and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and there's also oh good. sorry. Well, oh, I was just say there's also <laughs> <laughs> This happens You go. I don't know why this keeps happening, but no <laughs> no, I I was I was going I was going to bring up the question of um of players playing multiple characters, a la the passion play design that was in Ars Magica, if if that had been if that's something that's been considered. Um, definitely a possibility. Not really a reason why people couldn't. Um, I th I know how attached people get to their characters, so I wasn't really sure how much people would want to play multiple characters, but. I think maybe in a situation where there's one, you know, you have your main character and people also control some side characters just because sometimes with Austin style or, or you know, Hayer style or Radcliffe style uh, stories, you just, you have a lot of small characters that, you know, kind of walk on and off as needed. So certainly could be divvied up rather than having the GM control them. Mm-hmm. No reason you can't do it. Yeah. And within that, within that one, per, given some, given some of the things that I that I focus on, it did make me smile a bit to see that it looks like you plan on having a discussion on the dueling code. Which, oh, I'd like you to go into that, go into that, and what that what that meant for this particular era, as opposed to the concept of dualists in other eras. There we go. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. My browser just sort of went. No, I can't connect to Discord anymore. Well, did did you need me to repeat the question? <laughs> yes, please. Um, what was it again? Since you since on the Kickstarter page you mentioned a discussion on the du on the dueling code, and since that is something that I that is. A hall, is a hallmark of men, of many different fictions in many different cultures. I'd like you to go into a bit more detail on what the dueling code entailed in this particular era as opposed to other eras. Sure. Well, the main thing about dueling in this period is that uh, it had it had changed from the idea that we have of like the classical duel with swords and you know it's because I am so upset I need to fight you with a sword to first blood um, by the point of the Regency people were pretty much always using pistols um, and that sounds a lot deadlier but at the same time 
they did not they didn't really want it to be deadly and the entire point of the duel at this at, at this time was more about the person who gave offense saying oh man i'm sorry you can shoot at me um and i won't you know i won't try to duck out of it or something so they had pistols that were not supposed to have rifling in the barrels uh, so, you know, harder to aim. And there would also often be restrictions on how how long you had before you fired. Um, maybe you have to bring up your pistol and fire in the same instant. And the idea was just you go through this ceremony mm-hmm. and exchange bullets and that makes everything okay. Uh, that's the main distinction between the earlier one uh, or the earlier, you know, sword duel, mm-hmm. and uh, what was going on in the Regency, and the Regency was sort of the beginning of the end of it. Um, it's definitely by the middle of the 19th century in England, nobody's dueling anymore, and it's a totally different story on the continent that I am not best placed uh, to discuss. But actually, we have. I feel awkward talking about dueling because we have an amazing dueling expert on Ask Historians who knows so much more than I do about it. Mm -hmm. But yes, I definitely register that people are probably, I think, going to want to duel a bit in dandies and dandiesettes. Yeah, but even with that, (laughs) establishing establishing the code, I'd say, is a good way to Make clear that it's that challenging someone to a duel is not something that should be done lightly. Right. It is very serious. There's a, an interesting sort of dance of like, well, you don't want to be rude enough to provoke somebody into a duel, and you don't want to be uh, touchy enough to challenge somebody to a duel, but at the same time, you can't be, you know, you have to do something if somebody insults you badly enough. It's, it's, uh, a crisis in masculinity is what they always say in um, history, in mm-hmm. the field of history, when these things happen. Oh, yeah. And with that, in, with that in mind, when it comes to, when it come, like even even with the even with the role playing um, centric part of it, um. I think I can. I think I can assume that at the very least, you there will be a character sheet of of some de, of some details, whether that be mm-hmm. details about genealogy or about skills, what or what have you. Hmm. Um. Yes, I have the main things. Yes, you got to know who your family is. Um. You've got to know sort of what your uh, age based social role is. You know, are you a young gentleman who is looking to get married versus, you know, are you an older bachelor who has no intention of getting married? Um, Are you a widow or are you a matron? Um, You need to know what your class is and class is so nuanced and we tend to often think about historical class as very basic, like, are you noble? Are you rich? Are you poor? But, you know, there's shades of of rank in, in every rank where, you know, somebody who's a knight versus somebody who's very rich and has a country estate but doesn't have any title, um, a rector versus a vicar in the church and, and such. So mm-hmm. it's, it's definitely important to have all of these uh, ranks on your sheet so that you know where you're at. And I also have some information about ethnicity in the Regency because not everybody was, you know, a basic Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Mm -hmm. And um, proficiencies, uh, what are your skills, so on. I originally had, you know, very regimented, like, you choose two skills, and, you know, if you're in this class, you can only choose from these, and so on. And then I, I sort of backed off and went... Choose what you think is appropriate for your story. Mm -hmm. Um, And then lastly, we have attributes, which line up pretty closely with 
um, attributes in Dungeons and Dragons because I guess I'm just not very original. <laughs> uh, charm, wit, scholarship, looks, and income. Oh, and grace, um, which you can sort of use to build your character if you you need a little bit of a boost. But if you want, that can also relate to the dice rolls. Um, if you are choosing to play a more dice-based game. And, you know, if you roll your d6, you can go, oh, okay, this is high, so this person's very charming, and so on. And then that will relate to checks that you might make for success or failure later on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, taking that into, ac taking that into account, um, you did say... I know that you said that you are that um you have a handful of of um of of adventures and and the like and I'm guessing including included within that is a handful of sample NPCs that you that could be used as protagonists or antagonists in a given story. Yes. Yes, the the sample game scenarios that I gave have a each has a list of I don't know if I standardized how many for each one, but like six to nine characters that yeah could be could be picked up or could be just treated as NPCs. Um, either way, and you could take them out of the scenario that they you know have been given in at the back of the book and dump them into your own game because why not? Mm-hmm. And given given what you mentioned with the character sheet, one thing that I think I need I think I need to touch on is advancement. Mm -hmm. uh, some some people do it as a XP is currency thing. Some people do the the level up the level up thing, which I don't think you're doing based on what you've said. <laughs> um, and some do a you learn, but you learn better. You learn more by using, um, and in some in some cases, whether or not you're even going to learn is up to random chance. Um, RuneQuest has done that has done this in the past. Where do you fit into that paradigm when it comes to how a character would advance? So there isn't really much of an advancement in terms of skills built into the game um, because it is so... I, I don't want to use the phrase loosey-goosey, but it is very loosey-goosey um, in terms of, you know, if you say, my character is extremely accomplished, she can play the piano, she can sing, she can sew extremely well, and she speaks five languages... I mean, you are allowed to do that unless your GM says, no, rein it in, please. Um, and so, likewise, you there's nothing really to stop you. The same way in Nobilis, there's nothing to stop you from saying, well, I use my powers and I do such and such. You can say, I'm practicing piano, and then after you practice piano sufficient amount of times, you say, I'm, I'm good at piano now, and everybody goes, okay. Um, in the single player version that I have included at the end of the book as well, there is a more structured way of doing this because the single player version, in order to not just be, I'm writing a story, you do have to rely on dice rolls a lot more and process and say, okay, you get this many things you can do in a day and so on. And that does have a system of, you do this thing that you do not have listed as your proficiency and you do it a certain amount of times successfully and then now that's your proficiency as well and you don't have to roll for it anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind... But because what... it is... Oh, go ahead. Nope, sorry. I was just going to say, because it is storytelling, um, it is really more about collaborative agreement on what can and cannot be done mm -hmm. rather than like taking a character and continuing to level them up or or increase their skills. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count? I know this might change 
based on the based on the um, stretch goals? Um, it's hard to say because I have not um, like typeset it because it's you know it's still being finished in terms of like you say the stretch goals. It is. Um, about 80 pages right now as a document. So I'm assuming that it will probably be twice as long typeset and printed out. Mm -hmm. So about 160 pages. Which, I... Which is hard. It's hard to figure out without typesetting it. Yeah, that's that's the reason why I, nev I never ask for a specific specific um, <laughs> page count with these kind of things, but just a ballpark of it. Yeah. Especially since, well, the first casualty is always the battle plan. Yep. Um, yeah, I I am very, like, we'll just keep adding stuff, and then as I think of things, oh, yeah, we can add a section on that, and yeah. Well, you just but keep... I, think, I, I think about 160 sounds about right. But just keep adding stuff until so, until someone until someone says no more. You will add yeah, no, no more I pages. Have to print now. <laughs> yes. Great. Now I ha now I have this image of uh, of you being put in a of you being put in a cage because with with um the, with the <laughs> pencil just outside of it. it's like please let me write. Yes, I need to I need to add another section. I haven't talked about such and such yet. <laughs> oh. I only I only bring that up because because well I've I've had to put people in that in that position. Oh. And sometimes I've had myself put in that position. So it's it's one of it's one of those th it's one of those things that can go that can go any and any and any way. <laughs> any and any mm -hmm. way. What the hell? English is my first <laughs> language, I think. <laughs> Oh. But what do you what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date. Not a release date, but a general ballpark. Um I'm just double checking what I put in the Kickstarter. Um I believe my hope is to have things set by next summer. 2023 summer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I will likely have things sent out before then, but I'm not totally sure because it's it's really hard to tell because there's so many shortages with things uh, and, and stuff just being held up, in, you know, indefinitely that I am terrified of happening with this, um, with them being like, sorry, Lulu has a huge backlog and cannot print anything and and so on but i'm definitely thinking next summer at the latest i can i can certainly get that yeah and with all of that said i would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here Oh, well, thank you very much. It's been an interesting time and very good conversation. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I will definitely come back someday. And Looking of, forward to it. Yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>